So welcome. welcome. We are so glad that you're here today. I have a question for you, though. Um, so I'm from New Jersey, and I'm Italian. So I tend to talk very loud. But I do want to honor, if you can't hear, we can use a microphone. Can you hear OK? Awesome. All righty. All right, so does, any, does this look like familiar to any of you? Because I said so. You can't just do whatever they want. You can't just do whatever they want. I am in charge. How many of you have ever said this? <laughs> How effective was it? <laughs> okay, so we're going to do a little bit of about getting to know you. So now you have permission. How often do you get the permission? Take out your phone, please. <laughs> and find a picture on your phone that makes you happy. And then once you find that, with the people closest to you, share why the picture makes you happy. All righty. I love this activity. I, we do it when we uh, help train um, teachers. Um, obviously, it works with adult learners as well. So, um, so I have a question for you. How many of you, sorry, I felt uncomfortable on the right side. How many of you uh, showed pictures of your children? OK. How many of you showed pictures of your family? OK. So that, they bring joy to us all the time, right? Not, well, OK, not all the time. <laughs> um, <laughs> parenting is hard. It's challenging. And remembering that when you look at those pictures, you remember the joy that your children bring when they are being their brattiest <laughs> or they're being their most difficult. Remembering that joy that they really do bring to you. All right. So you have a notes page in your packet. Take one minute to jot down any thoughts, worries, issues, or questions you might have about power struggles. It could be your own personal experiences right now with power struggles, or you're like, I don't like, is this really a power struggle? When do I, when am I supposed to just be the parent and not negotiate, not compromise with our children? So just take a second. It's the why you're here, right? What, what you brought you here today? And if you feel comfortable, go ahead and share with the person next to you your reason why you are here. coming back and joining us. Uh, we appreciate it and we're actually very excited that you are so willing to share the, the reason that uh, you are here today because we are hoping that we're going to be able to meet your needs, make connections with other people that might have similar whys as to why they're here and including us. Of course, even though we do the trainings, we are parents 
we have had experiences, believe it or not, getting into power struggles. <laughs> and so we are going to share some of those connections that hopefully we can make with you. And just accept the fact that nobody's perfect. It's perfectly normal to experience some of those concerns that you're having and to think differently the, the next time that a power struggle could be occurring and how to maybe get out of it a little faster or a little differently than we have in the past. Okay. So what we're going to focus on today are these three oh, you're fine, points. It's hard to get out of a power struggle if we're not recognizing when they're occurring. So we want to be able to recognize some of those signs, when they might occur, and then how to gently get out of those without it getting into a, a place where we're yelling at each other. Because it, and it will happen. We just want to ha have it happen less often. Okay. So this is the definition of a power struggle. It's a, all about control. We hear often, well, but I don't want my student or my child to win, to think that they're in charge. Has anybody felt that before? That's the root of a power struggle. And so we're here to challenge our thinking today about it not being a winning experience, but really how to have a productive conversation that allows us to maybe not get, again, into those situations um, initially. So it can really impact a relationship, whether it's between friends, between spouses, or between a parent and a child. So this is the developmental one, mm -hmm. okay. Hooray, I'm in a power struggle with my child. <laughs> <laughs> Never would you say that, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so understanding, just like Lori was saying, a power struggle is actually a developmental characteristic milestones for our children. They're supposed to want their autonomy. They're supposed to. How many of you are carrying around your 15-year-old? No, you want them to be independent. <laughs> you want them to be independent. Am I not loud enough? I'm sorry. Okay. Um, sorry, we have signals that if I have to slow down <laughs> or be louder. Um, it's a developmental a process for our children. We, we want them to not question authority necessarily, but we want them to think for themselves. We want them to learn through their experiences the right from wrong. If we keep telling them what to do, how to do it, when to do it, then they're never going to build their own independence. They're never going to build their own autonomy. And we want to send our kids off into the world after they're all grown up and they've gone to school to be independent adults and so that they can be able to think for themselves and they can make decisions by themselves without having to check with everyone else. So from toddlerhood to adolescence, it's, it's a normal developmental process for our children to try to engage you in a power struggle, try to exert their sense of independence or their sense of righteousness. So why do they do it? Again, just like I said, it is a basic social and emotional need. How many of you like to be told what to do? Not me. <laughs> and a lot of us don't like to be told what to do. We are told what to do a lot of the times, right? We follow our boss's leads. We, we ha the police officers tell us what to do, how to drive, how not to drive. We, I get that. But it's the way we respond or how we project what it is we want people to do. That's going to make, that's going to make the decision of if it's going to be a power struggle or if it's going to be a conversation or if it's going to be a request versus a demand. Um, going back to again, we want our children to separate from us. How many of you find that hard? How many of you have babies? Little two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, right? I know that you want them to be your mommy forever. I promise you, you will always be their mommies and daddies. You will always be their mommies and daddies. And we do want them to be able to separate from us. And the third point is uh, the child discovers they can create a consequential emotion or behavior by the parent. How many of your children know how to push your buttons? And every time, they, not every time, but a lot of the time until you got smarter, how many times did they push your buttons and you just engaged? Still, exactly. I have, uh, I have two sons and a daughter. 
and my daughter still knows how to <laughs> push my button. <laughs> she absolutely knows how to push my button, and she has the uh, ability to just now hang up on me. <laughs> and then I get all mad. <laughs> And then, I, then, I'm, then, I'm, then I can just decide to engage in the power struggle. Then I can like, fine, I'm not, I'm, not call, I'm not calling her back. I'm not calling her back. Well, of course I'm going to call her back. But my initial reaction is to get angry, is to get real. Like, how dare you hang up on me? So what it takes, it takes a strong person then to step back and see how it is that you're participating in this power struggle. Want to go? So one of the reactions that our body has in a power struggle is this fight or flight mode. Has anybody heard of that before? Sometimes we, we add freeze to that also, and that happens sometimes too. It's kind of like this quick rush, like Michelle was talking about, of emotion and, and it affects our brain. And so when someone says something to us that kind of puts us on the defensive, we get sometimes this fight or flight feeling. And that's what allows us to have that that reaction to respond or to react, I should say, really, yeah. more to um, whatever it, our, our children are saying to us. And what we challenge ourselves and all of you to do is to find your happy place to try to give yourself a breather, something that allows your brain to not take all of those feelings and run with it, but to take those feelings and, and kind of push them into a place where you, you, we have more control about how we respond and react to our students, our children. Because when that happens in our brain, our brain actually chemically mm -hmm. stops working the way we want it to. And that's why afterwards a lot of us have felt, oh, why did I just do that? Has anybody here felt that way, a little remorseful afterwards? Remember, I have the teenagers. I'm in it every day. <laughs> every day. I'm, I'm like, mm, this is what I want to say. Did I actually stop myself from saying it? Or do I now have to go back and kind of right the wrong? That's what we call it in our house. Because we're going to hurt each other's feelings, not intentionally. It's that emotion that kind of runs. And so we right the wrong afterwards. We make it better because it can really have a lasting impact if we kind of leave those emotions hanging. Um, also, when we're in those moments, we're not worrying about how it's making our kids feel. We're really worrying about, or we're running on what, how it's making us feel. How is that reaction making us feel? Like my dad used to say, you know, <laughs> I feel better after yelling at you. And then he would walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and he's wonderful, but we've kind of evolved and learned that maybe that isn't the best way <laughs> to deal with some power struggles. And it, and it does impact your relationship. It impacts my relationship with him and the way that, my, that I parent my children based on mm -hmm. our research that we use a lot in our trainings. It, I'm going to have a little bit, I hope, of a different relationship with my children. Overpowering versus empowering. What do those two words kind of make you feel? When you hear overpowering, did I hear not good? How else does that make you feel? That kind of that initial sense? Not comfortable. Not comfortable, suffocating. Stress. Stress, out of control. So I hear words that I might group as kind of negative in feeling and emotion. Is that correct? How about empowering? Nice. 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 Positive. Good. Healthy. Healthy. Ooh, Ooh, that's a good one. That is a good one. A better way to get a resolution. You want to, you should do the training. <laughs> that was perfect. No, that was perfect. That is exactly what we're looking for. Again, it's that shift in our thinking where our parenting used to or used to teach us right that those willful behaviors those stubborn children are being disrespectful and it's viewed as bad but now if we think it as kind of the willful behavior they're learning where their boundaries are they're trying to develop those independent skills developmentally doing what they're supposed to be doing as difficult as that might be we kind of change our mindset in thinking okay 
How can we help them develop those skills in a way that still creates a trusting environment and a supporting environment from parent to child? Take a second to read this scenario. says every teenager <laughs> and when your children come home from college <laughs> when they come home from college my son said I he moved back to um, study for his LSATs so he lived with us while he was studying and needless to say I heard that a lot I also said that a lot I can't wait until you have your own place as well so what do you what what kinds of things are you reading into this? I think she should explain why she wants him to stay home with us because he said he doesn't get it. Okay, so she should explain why she wants him to stay home. So the rationale why you want her to stay home. Compromise. Compromise. Did you see compromise in there? No, not in there. Exactly. Good. And communication. Communication. Poor communication. Okay. What was that? Blindsided. No, one-sided. One-sided, okay. That's true, because who's the boss here? The mom. Someone else? They don't acknowledge the child's feelings or frustrations. They don't acknowledge the child's uh, feelings or frustrations? All right, you totally all have it. You have to have it all down. And yet, we still go, we still say, I'm going to tell you, within two weeks, you're still going to have the same conversation. <laughs> You're still going to have a conversation. I just, but as you're learning some other ways to give rationale, to be empathetic, to really listen to what your daughter is trying to say or your son is trying to say to you.
The name of the film is In It Out. It's about feelings and um, raising children and the emotions. And all, so really, that's really actually how our mind processes. You know, we don't have little cartoons in our head, but we, that is how our mind processes. And sometimes we're all in and we're totally attentive, and sometimes we're not so attentive. And we're not attentive and we miss the message. What happens? The foot goes down, right? So what, what's your takeaway from that? Takeaway? Someone needs to be in control of their feelings. I was uh, trying to be where, uh, trying to form this empathy. Mm -hmm. So try to understand where the other person's coming from. Right. So, but that you have to be the other person. Mm -hmm. because everyone Talking with empathy, I'm sorry. Because everyone has feelings. Everyone has feelings. It, it, they, they identified, the mom identified right away, oh, this is not, something going on here. This is, this is not the daughter that I know. Okay, and she knows that something's going. But how forthcoming are our children really? when they, they stopped. How forthcoming are our children really when we're like, hey, is everything okay? You're either going to get the foot drop or you're going to get get away from me or you're going to get bawling, right? All right. The other thing is too, I don't know, I don't know if that's working. working. Oh, no, it is. Is they, at the beginning, joy was missing, right? That, that character, that part of her, her emotion was missing. And so sometimes we come to the table with some missing emotions too. Whether we had a rough day at work, or maybe you're taking care of a, you know, an a okay. ill family member, or something, something that's just preventing us from feeling joyful in that moment. And so how does that allow us to react to other people in our family? Is it easy to, to react in a positive way when that's missing? No. And so it goes back again to recognizing how are we communicating, what's going on with us, can, is it okay to say, you know what, I had a rough day today, I just need some time, so that when you do engage, sorry, when you do engage, I'm from New York, I'll talk loud. When, when you do engage with family members or friends, they understand what's happening, and maybe, again, giving yourself some time to kind of just Get your own emotions in check, being able to find that joy so that you can be an active participant in that conversation is going to go a lot farther than just going, being there and not really being present and allowing all of the emotions to be part of a conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah? I know we, we have a tough job. We are called and work with schools where some of our students um, are really struggling with behaviors. And it's hard to not take that personally sometimes because we want to kind of take that, that feeling of pain or sadness or frustration, whatever it is, from the student, right? It, you kind of want to just say, give it to me so you don't have to deal with it. So when we go home, as much as we try to leave work at work, we're humans. It happens. And then I go home and then I have my son who has ADHD and I'm trying to corral him to do his homework and I can tell you my joy <laughs> is really deep in my head. I've got to find it. And so it's just trying to link our feelings, what we can be in control of for ourselves, and how we can also be empathetic and understand the other people that are involved in our conversations, what they're going through. It's a lot, right? Yes. Do you think that might have, if they gave the child some space, do you think there's a possibility that this conversation could have gone in a different direction? Yeah, but I guess on the other hand, I also understand and appreciate that the parents mm -hmm. do want to be So how do we balance mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And those, so the dad was, a. How do you, how involved, and this is not a gender exactly. thing. Exactly. It just, we're exactly. just using this as an example. In this example, how engaged was the dad? In this example, this parent wasn't as engaged, so he was missing some of those cues. And it might have been, what might you have done differently? Left him alone. Maybe giving them some space, the, the, the dad. father not yeah. involving the dad. Don't invite him to the conversation. <laughs> yes, so maybe in that moment that wasn't the best way to help. Yeah? But also, I've learned that to when I have those moments and I'm feeling like that and I want my kids to like give me a little bit of space, I've learned through 
throughout having with my daughter is to actually give her a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. But just let her know that I am there. Mm -hmm. And when you do want to talk, I am here to listen. Because mm -hmm. if you try to engage with her at that moment, it goes just like that. Mm -hmm. So your experience of giving her space and then revisiting that that concern you have later on when she's in a better kind of mindset yep. has been more successful than forcing her to talk when she's not ready. Yep. Even when it's something that I know she's done wrong, mm -hmm. I say, well, you know, I understand there's different sides. Let me give you a little bit of space. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about it. And mm -hmm. it does, there is a better result because I think we, be, we hear each other better mm -hmm. than if we just go both in because then we're just like, so. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you have found a way in which you can be much more productive and helpful between both you and your child by, give, by just giving her that little bit of time, which is perfect. I have a question. There's a very powerful phrase over there. It says, you know, they, um, if the task of the teenager is to part the parents and then retire them years later, <laughs> must act, but as consultants rather than manager. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, how can you, is there some things that you can do to be a consultant of your teenager, mm -hmm. but still a manager? That is So what I love what you say is it's all about hearing. It's about honoring and respecting them. So right now, my daughter's 25. On Tuesday, out of nowhere, it was my birthday. So out of nowhere, she texts me, happy birthday, mommy, I love you, da 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 And then we sent her a text back and she's like, well, I can't talk right now, Brian and I just broke up. Well, she's been dating this guy for a year and a half and they were gonna get married, okay? They weren't engaged, but they were, I mean, that's where, and I'm like, what, what? So I, of course, want to, I want to comfort her. I want to take over. And she's like, I, I'm not ready to talk about it. I'm not ready to talk about it. So as painful as it was for me, as difficult as it was for me, I was like, okay, I'm always here for you. We can talk about it when you feel comfortable to be able to talk about it. My husband, on the other hand, <laughs> is ready to call the boyfriend and go, what in God's name happened? And yelling at him. And then he wants to call Lauren, who's my daughter, to say, what if you must tell us what's going on? You must tell us what's going on. You must tell us. And I'm like, pump the brakes here, okay? We have to honor them. And that's what we have to honor some of the, our children's decisions. As much as we don't agree with them, as much as, as we do not agree with them, that's how you build the independence and the autonomy, okay? So if it, I, my, I guess the caveat might be if they are making a, a decision that might break the law, or is a safety issue. That's the boundary you might have to put into place for you as a parent, but you can't really, you can't, you can't navigate your relationship with your children, both as a manager and as a consultant. You can, you can when they're younger, probably, but as they're older, not so much so. I'm talking when they're younger. Yes. Because you are the one who set up the rules. A hundred percent. So, you know, because they don't know better. Right. Exactly. exactly. And problem how, solve it. Yeah. How do you explain, not explain, but how do you navigate? Mm -hmm. So maybe as we continue on, can we hold that thought and see if we come up with some strategies along the way and then revisit that as we move along? Because those are really great questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that we might be able to cover some of them as we kind of continue on this journey together. So jot that on down. So I had another question. Like a side conversation. conversation. Right, a side conversation. But talk about things that just weren't so great with me that day. Mm -hmm. And then talk about some good things that happened. And then kind of engage my husband in a conversation. 
Right. 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 Distraction is a great um, tool to use to diffuse situations. It is. It's a, that is a, a really, a, can be a very effective tool. So thank you for sharing that. Okay, you also have another paper in your uh, packet. Purpose, uh, so this is what I have control over. This might help really help you navigate and really put it onto a piece of paper. What do you have control over? And this is what I wish I had control over. How many of you wish that you could read your kids' text messages all the time or emails just in case they're making bad choices? Just in case. So it should have been uh, one of the handouts. Uh, one of the handouts. It's right here. Oh, no. Is anyone missing a sheet? Oh, sorry. Oh, it's double sided. One side it says. Oh, there it is. My most May typical power struggle, the other side so is purpose yeah, of power looks like struggles. This. Does anyone need one? Thank you. So just take a minute to jot down what you do have control over and what you wish you have control over. Do you need a packet? How many of you are filling the left side quickly? <laughs> Take now another 30 seconds to finish your thoughts. with the left side this is what I have control over for element if you have elementary age children answer this question what do you currently have control over a schedule TV time did I hear I heard something else activities the number of activities nutrition it's a good one okay now of High school, middle school, high school parents. What do you have control over? <laughs> what was that? Do the access to their devices? Cur curfew. Curfew. You think you have control over that? <laughs> What's that? Money. That's a good one. How about transportation? Whether the phone gets renewed. Okay, some, some similarities. All right. What do you wish you had control over, elementary parents? Friends. Friends? The choice of friends or how to access and make friends? Okay. I'd like to control language. You would like to control language. But that's a good one. That's really a good one because you really can't. You can impose a consequence for it. Right. Yep. Their confidence. Their confidence. Priorities. Priorities. Okay. Because they might differ from what you think they should be. Okay. In the back. More communication. Like I'd like to know more about what's inside the 
Yeah. Okay, more communication. Mm -hmm. He has to do his schoolwork. So That's not an option. Right. And that works out well all the time. <laughs> this is a much bigger one, but it's expectations. Mm -hmm. And I have found having raised children once and now doing it a second time that we impose our expectations onto yes. our children which then becomes the root of the power struggle because we want what's best for them yes. assigned by us. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, that's powerful. You must know my husband. <laughs> <laughs> How about for high school? What, what do you wish you had control, control over? What do you expose them to? <laughs> Exposure to uh, media, friends. Yeah. How would he still react to the situation? Wait a minute, hold on, so, yeah. go ahead. How to react to the situation. Okay, how to react or respond. I heard another one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? A hundred percent. You're absolutely right. Priorities. Priorities in, in school, right. for, for school as well, as, right. or in life, or what are their priorities in life, whether it, what it looks like as an elementary right. age student versus, or and, a mm -hmm. high school student. Because then, because it's a whole different set of priorities mm -hmm. that they have to start thinking about. And in my house, I don't know if anybody can relate, the priority for my, one of my children is not necessarily to get his homework done first and to the best of his ability, but it's to get it done quickly so he can access computer time. Especially because he gets home before I do and before my husband does. So it is, that is a number one, the number one struggle in my house. So I do completely relate to that. Did you have something to share? How old is your daughter? She's 15. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Again, it's, that's where she is developmentally. Yep. But you know, our, chil our children, especially teens, I've done a lot of um, actually parent resource uh, center uh, trainings on teen behavior and developmental uh, milestones and characteristics of teenagers. And it's, it's challenging. It's very, very, ch it, is, it can be very challenging at times for some of our, our teenagers and parenting some of our teenagers. Yeah. I'm sorry? Time management and organization. Yes. Time management and organization. That probably would go through both elementary and secondary, right? Okay. Okay. Right. It does make sense. So the question is, um, for a child with OCD, how do you differentiate, and help me if I'm summarizing this correctly, how do you differentiate what's, what's the OCD part of it where it, that you, they have to do this, they have to engage in the struggle versus being just stubborn? Is that correct? Okay. Can I ask you to hold on to that because the second part of this is going to probably address some of those, um, the, that question? Okay, and then we can help tease it out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. outside of their yeah. Yep. Yep. And again, I think that could really straddle both areas, the elementary kids mm -hmm. as well as our uh, secondary kids. It's a little, it feels more terrifying at the secondary level with the driving and whose house they're at that you don't know those families as well anymore as you, and drink it. Right. Right. Yep. It exactly. It's scary. All right. Impulsivity. 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 Yes. All right, so which issues, I think we kind of covered this, so where, where do you spend your most time on trying to what you have control over and what you don't have control of? But really the net net when you leave here is I want you to understand that you don't have to control anything. You don't have to control anything or anyone, because actually you can't control anyone. 
You, you, the only person you can control is yourself. That's all you can. And that's the rest of this is all about how do we manage ourselves and how do we respond instead of react when we are faced with these power struggles, knowing that they're supposed to power struggle with us. But it doesn't have to become an explosive power struggle. It, become, it can become just a power struggle. And we move on from that. Or it could be a problem solving type of problem, uh, uh, power struggle. All right, so there's two types of parenting. There's coercive parenting, which is the action or practice of persuading someone to do something by using force or threats. If you don't follow my directions, I'm taking away your keys. Versus, hey, the direction is I need you to empty the dishwasher and load the dishwasher, and then you can have the keys. Which one sounds more amenable, agreeable, and respectful? The second one. Yeah, I watched this great video. Um, it was too long for me to put it in here, but they, they were doing a parody of these four moms sitting at the table. And they were talking to each other like we would sometimes talk to our children. Like she was picking up her um, wine glass, and, I, and so she picks up the wine glass, and I'd be, now, Lori, you know that you are not allowed to be drinking so much of that wine glass. You can't do that. Or someone, she, she went to go pick up, like, an extra cookie. Oh, you have to finish this cookie first before you eat this. <laughs> Sometimes we catch ourselves talking to our middle schoolers and high schoolers like this, okay? So it, being respectful to your parents, for, to your uh, children, is really important when we are, especially when it is a challenging situation, because you are their role model of how to handle conflict. You are their role model. So if you become sarcastic and nasty with them, that's their learned behavior then, and so they're going to give it right back to you in spades, and they're going to be way better at it than we are. <laughs> so you can, the guilt, the threats, the punishment, the nagging, withdrawal of love, I mean, that's extreme, sarcasm, criticism, intimidation, humiliation, yelling, because you, all that, you are angry. You are annoyed. You are frustrated. And when you operate out of emotion, again, you're not thinking from here. <laughs> you're thinking from here. So we want to make sure that we, we want to be cognizant when we do go into co coercive power, uh, power parenting. I have done it five bazillion times. There is no doubt about it. I mean, I have threatened my kids. I have, I mean, not bad, bad, but enough that like, no, you're not going anywhere. No, nope, you're not allowed to, because I said so, because I said so. Um, or numerous uh, um, examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, I mean, we use that electronics kind of yes. threat often. You know what? You're not, gonna do, you're not doing your homework. You're not studying. Then I'm going to take away your electronics. So my, the, my husband, is that is his favorite line. So we had to have a private conversation about, you know what? Why don't we flip it into him earning the electronic time? Because then it's not on us. It's on him, on my son. You know what? You didn't do what we asked you to do, so you must not have wanted that electronic time that much. All you have to do is this, and look what you get to earn. So it's, this is a decision you're making. We want you to have it. You just, all you have to do is you know, finish your math homework. But it's, it's, the, it's flipping this so that it's not, the, it's not us saying, you're not, you don't have access to this because you didn't follow what I said. It's more the, you didn't do what was the expectation, so then you don't get to earn that extra, that special. It's not just expected that it's there for you all the time. And that has actually helped a lot. And again, here we are, we do, we do this, right? And I'll tell you, for every time that I, I say it right and I give myself like a yes, there's many times where I'm like, oh, I knew I should not have done that because I didn't give myself that break to speak from a non-emotional point. It's always when I'm speaking from an emotional place that I end up afterwards having to write that wrong. Yes. That's already there. It's hard. It's very hard. And he. So for him, it's more his computer gaming. That's what he wants. <laughs> I don't understand either. Wow, Lori, that was impressive. <laughs> that, 
That's why we're here together, because we don't understand their brains. <laughs> so for him, it's, it's really more his gaming computer. But I will say, what we did establish in our house, and it was, talk about a power struggle, it was resetting expectations, is we have a basket in our house where our phones go, and I will tell you, they don't go there until my husband and I get home, because... That's what you have it's control just, over. Yes. I don't have control over them doing it beforehand. And so there are certain times in our house where we have electronic free time and all, my phone, my, it all goes in the basket. It was a major struggle at the beginning, establishing those routines. It was also part of a family conversation that we had about the why. So my, my son who has ADHD is very righteous like things are very important to him with regard to there being a purpose and it being right and so we had to really have a family conversation about what, because to him he's like who cares like what do you care if I have my phone so we had to think kind of deeply about how do we share this information with my two teenagers who basically will tune us out the minute they hear something they don't want about why this actually is important to us and that fam we only have you know a few short years together and so we need to make that that hour a night or whatever it is actually meaningful because the fact that we even have an hour a night on most nights is unusual is very unusual both mm -hmm. my kids play sports they do other activities and so we had to actually go into that then if i have the phone it's very easy for me to say you know what, first you need to get your dishes in the dishwasher and clear the table before you pick up the phone. But again, that's, that's just my house and it took, and it was not easy, I will say that. But that's how we established kind of, and I don't know that my kids actually still know that that was a way for us to kind of have, have a little control over their, their screen time, but it did work. It took months. But the language of first then is really important. Yeah. First you do this, then you get this. Mm -hmm. And then the responsibility, just like Lori said, is on them. Right. We, are, we don't take any, oh, you're not giving me my phone. That's not true. That's not true. First you do this, then you're going to get your phone. It's all good. Someone had a question? Who, who has that same problem? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's. Did you hear that? The difference between a right and a privilege. And I cannot believe it, but the ADHD child mm -hmm. said to me yesterday, I know, I know, it's not a right. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I like that phraseology. Yes. That's good. Wow. I thought, whoa. Well, right so, or privilege? Right. It's and a privilege to have a phone. Yeah. yeah. It's not a right. And we have a basket. I can't believe I can see something right. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that is why it took us months. Yes, <laughs> that's okay. And sometimes they'll push those buttons. Well, I don't want to put it in the basket. I want to put it over here. How much does it matter to you? If he, if that's, and so that is a personal decision. If you are willing to engage in another power struggle about where it is, because you said it has to go in the basket, or for whatever reason they want it on the counter charging because. That's oh, just, no. <laughs> just what they want. The point is for me, like, what is my big picture? I want, I want time with my family without a phone. You want to keep it on the counter? I'm willing to do that as long as we have that time together without our, our electronics getting in the way. So you are clearly doing a lot right. And I feel better that other people are doing the same thing because maybe I'm actually doing something right. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, I it in and it went all the way from the kitchen to the 
kids. <laughs> so and that's actually not twisting your words. That's, that's taking you literally. So, because they're so much smarter. <laughs> that, brilliant, he's a brilliant young man. <laughs> so then it's, it's about setting, setting and clarifying boundaries. It's the clarifying. So yeah. how might we then yeah. rephrase that? Yeah. How might we rephrase that? So we know plugging into the kitchen is not really going to quite, that, that general broadness. Using this, ex, using this charger cord, <laughs> your phone must be plugged into the kitchen. That's the rule. Using this cord and only this cord. We might even have to go down that route. <laughs> I'm assuming that we've said that. She, she did say that because he, she, he can't have it overnight. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I would say that. Yeah. If you need your sleep at night, you can't be up all night. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And we've, we've gone through that conversation. So for the sake of time, can we move on a little bit? Because a lot of these, we're, the second part of this is actually some of these strategies that we're talking about. <laughs> Again, this is just the, the ugly cycle of coercive parenting. No matter what, you're still arguing with your child or you're still interrogating, you're still nagging, because it's not good enough. Someone brought up like my standards versus my child's standards. It's, it, it can't be just always my standards. Again, if we're talking about safety or something more important, yes. But sometimes our children have to be able to have a say to what their standards are. So when we engage in a primarily coercive parenting, you see an increase of child aggression, poor quality in your relationship, some, potentially some mental health issues, because if they always are feeling not good enough, because we keep giving the message they're not good enough or they can't make their own decisions. I have encountered parents, um, friends of mine actually, who, I mean, their children were 12, 13, 14 years old and they did not know how to make a decision without going to their parents first. That's, and shockingly enough, how successful do you think they really were freshman year of college? They weren't very successful. They were calling their mom and dad who had moved to the West Coast to ask for help on how to help uh, problem solve an issue she was having with her professor. You're 18, 19 years old, okay? You could ask for advice, but they were asking for them to call the professor to help problem solve it, okay? So, we so we, our job is to build our children up so that they can feel confident Okay, when we can point out all the good things that they're doing so that they can feel confident and comfortable. And when they make a mistake, it's just a mistake. That's all it is. So authentic power parenting, it doesn't judge the child as wrong. You really are not looking at, you're just looking strictly at the behavior, not your child. You're looking at, oh, you made a bad choice. Okay, what's going to happen now? What do we do now? Okay, not, I can't believe you did that again, or name calling, or any of those coercive parenting uh, techniques. That's not going to help your child build confidence. Actually, it's going to build that they're not going to want to talk to you at all. So here's an example of an authentic parenting scenario. This might be a little fairy tale. <laughs> the message of this, though, is acknowledging when you have misbehaved. When you have misbehaved. So you, 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 I'm assuming they've had this conversation about having a bad temper and managing your behavior and self-regulating. But when we don't self-regulate ourselves, remember, you're their role models. So catching yourself and acknowledging, oh, that wasn't right of mommy or daddy. That was not right. Let me rephrase that. Let me take a breath. And then, I, and I, I am sorry. I am sorry. It is profound what an, a, a child gets from an adult who says, I am sorry. I made a mistake. Okay. So we communicate using three different um, areas of, of our body. One, is through our words. One 
is through our tone of voice, and the other is our body language. When we are authentic or viewed as authentic, it's because all three of those areas are actually working together. So for example, if I say to my, and this happens all the time, I'm at the sink washing dishes after dinner, and my daughter is talking to me, and I'm uh -huh her, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And she says to me, you're not listening to me. And I'm like, I am listening to you. She's like, no, you're not listening to me. Your back is to me, and you're not even like making any sort of response other than uh-huh. So hasn't that happened to anybody else? <laughs> so my words were there, like I'm listening, but my tone of voice was kind of like not expressive enough for her. And my body language, that 55% of how we communicate, was definitely not showing her that I was listening because I wasn't even facing her. Kind of like in that video with the dad, right? He was there, he was present, he was looking at his daughter, but he really didn't have that body language. He wasn't engaging with her and it wasn't working. So she was getting even more frustrated because he, he just, in her mind, wasn't listening. And really, he probably wasn't because he didn't have all three of those um, active parts of his body going on at the same time. And so when we want to actually communicate and show somebody that we are really listening and understanding what they're saying, we have to make sure that we're using the correct words, that our body language is open. Like I'm not going up to Michelle and saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, my little New York sass, right? She's going to get that message that she is not really agreeing with me or understanding what I'm saying. So we really want to be present for our, for our children in looking at them when they're talking to us, having that what we call open body language, maybe even sitting down next to them, and making sure our tone, the way those words are coming out, are in a way that is welcoming, to, that encourages our children to talk more to us. Does, has anybody had experience when you're fully engaged with your child, something happens where all of a sudden they're just like, Psh, they just spill? In the car. In the yes. car, yes, yes, because you, they're sitting with you. You, are, you may not be looking at them. Sometimes they want a little bit of a barrier. It's safer for them. But you're really engaged. There's nothing else yep. to distract you, right? Even you turn the radio down a little bit or whatever it might be. And so there, your, your way in which you're telling them you are listening is working for them. And all of a sudden, you get those, those kind of um, conversations that maybe didn't happen at the dinner table or didn't happen immediately after something was bothering them. It comes out there because they know that you're actively engaged in whatever it is that they're saying. So if something isn't working, these, this is what we say kind of check we check ourselves in the mirror. Are we saying the right words? Are we talking in the right way? And is our body showing the person we're talking to that we're interested in what they have to say? But isn't that powerful? Our words are only 7% of how we communicate. 38% is tone, and then the majority is, is our body language. So a little story about a communication issue and a power struggle. My daughter was 16 and a half, 17. She had already had a driver's license. And we got into it, as happens often. We got into it, screaming at each other, yelling at each other, very ugly. So I'm like, fine, just go to your room. Just go to your room. Just go to your room. So calm down. So I think I'm going to go upstairs and talk to her and say, all right, so let's kind of acknowledge I'm sorry for yelling and all that. So I open her door. She's not there. She's not, not there. there. I'm like, so, so now yeah. what do you think I went to? <laughs> no, no, not panic. panic. <laughs> Fury. How, How dare, dare she disobey me? me. Right. Um, so, so then I go look for a car, and of course it's not there. there. So, so one would think that I could just be a relaxed, calm person and then maybe be concerned. Oh, no, I still stayed in fury. So I'm calling her and texting her. Do you think she's picking up? We're responding. No. So what do I do? This is my cray cray, you know, okay, it's not, yes. I got in my car and I drove to where I figured the house she was, to Morgan's house, okay, to Morgan's house. So there I see her car and I'm like, and I'm still furious, 
<laughs> and I'm typing all kinds of things, and I'm like, you better come outside. I'm pounding on the door. Uh, did you think they answered? No. <laughs> so now my fury is way up here. So evidently I was so irritating to my daughter, and so, and she had obviously calmed down because she texts me. She texts me. She's 17. Mom, I just think we need to take a break for a second. <laughs> And I think we both need to calm down. Uh, that was like, like this huge ton of bricks like hitting me upside the head. Like, oh my God, is this my 17-year-old who's telling me to calm down and take a breath? She was right. I was the great, yes. I was the crazy person. I was the crazy person. We weren't, nothing was getting, not, there was no effective communication going on whatsoever because I just kept running out. I was coming from, how dare you not listen to me? How dare you? Okay. <laughs> he was not home. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yep. That's the best thing that we can do. Again, you are role. It's on me because if I feel like I'm losing control, I need to step back because when you lose control, what comes out of this? Nothing good. Nothing good. So think about when you are operating from anger or fury or how dare you to take the breath, take the time out, walk away. I'm not ready to talk right now because nothing good is going to come out of this conversation. Let's come back in 10. Here's actually, here's even better because it's not a control thing. Would you like to come back in 10 minutes or 15 minutes to problem solve? Because it's not going away. It's not going away, but I'll honor and respect that we need some time. And it's okay, like some of your kids might actually get to a point where they can say to you, I need a break. That is, and this is a conversation I've had with my husband, that is not the time to then say, no, we need to talk about it right now. Because they are actually using what you have modeled, what you have taught them in a very expected and appropriate way. And we do want to honor that. Because my son listens to music, that's how he calms down. So as soon as I see those earbuds go in, I know he needs to calm down. And he's allowed access to that for a specified amount of time. Again, that's a conversation ahead of time to know that he's advocating for his own take a break. The other thing that we do is I gave her a yellow handkerchief or a bandana. And so whenever there's like, I don't want to talk to you, it's like put it outside Ooh. the door. So this is yellow for a bandana. Did you all hear that? So um, one of the, the strategies that are used that was just shared was that um, a, a, her daughter, how old is your daughter? Twelve. Twelve. So at a young age has been taught to use some sort of symbol. This is a, happens to be a yellow handkerchief. And she will kind of ha hang it outside the door to indicate that she needs some alone time. And that it's honored. And then I guess when she's ready, she'll remove the, the bandana. How many of you would struggle not to go into the door? <laughs> yeah. But no, no, I need to, we need to talk about this right now. What the, um, is it successful for the most part? Sometimes, yeah. I mean, it, before that, I was going into the room, shutting the door, and sitting in front of the door, and saying, We're going to talk about this. And then, yeah, didn't go that wasn't effective. Right. That's amazing. Classes, you just learn mm -hmm. that you have to, right. It's a two way street, and you have to kind of mm -hmm. give them a little bit of space before you. For sure. Yes, and I, th I think Lori used the great word. You have to honor and respect their feelings. They're not available to talk to you right now. And not that it's not going to ever happen, but th they're not available to talk. And it might, it might, you might not talk to the next day. And that's okay. That's okay. As, mu as painful as it will be for you <laughs> to not go in and let, we just need to solve the problem right now. Because you know what? It's not about you at this time. It is about them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Basic needs. Which is hard to find times when they're not hungry. Right. Boys are always they're always hungry. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Yep. That's brilliant. I have boys as well, so I'm pretty late. And they're all different. Uh-huh. Like oh. when he wants you to talk to him and he's almost screaming at you, get away from me, I don't want to talk. 
But when he likes that, mm -hmm. he, wanted, he really wants you to be there. Because the minute you leave, he's like, no, no, come back. Aw. Like, what in the world? Right. <laughs> so I don't, you know, you have the, the tools, but then if you listen to them, it's not mm -hmm. what they really want anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But as the parent, you recognize right. nobody knows your child better than, yeah. than the parent, right? And so sometimes you do have to trust your instinct. Mm -hmm. And what we share is kind of general information and strategies, and then you apply it to really meet your individual child's needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great to know that. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. <laughs> right. So the, the, the uh, statement, what the comment was about, really being cognizant of the transition from that preteen elementary age to to the teenage years, for, particularly for females, but also for males. I mean, kids they all they go through growth spurts and hormone changes. It all happens for both for both uh, genders. All right. So there's commu communication using I messages. I feel frustrated when I go to load the dishwasher while cooking, it's still full of clean dishes because it makes it harder for me to cook and clean up at the same time. Okay, I messages versus you never empty the dishwasher. I, how many times do I have to tell you? How many of you said this to your husbands or wives or uh, your children? Okay, you messages, you automatically go what? Okay, bring it on. Fight or flight. Okay, I messages, we're taking responsibility for our own emotions. So you have on the back of that paper that you're writing on before, what are some of your triggers? What are some of your triggers? My trigger was my son doesn't do his chores. This is the coercive reaction would be to do this. And my authentic response could be look a little bit different, which would invite more cooperation. So write down one trigger that you have how you uh, have responded, but it probably didn't work out so well, and how you could re how you can rephrase that for the more authentic par uh, parenting. Okay, so instead of discussing this and sharing triggers, um, use this as a tool for yourself. When you have time to self-reflect, um, as you absorb all the information and you pertain to you personally, you as your family unit, use it as a tool for you to say, okay, well, wait a minute, or use it as a, a, uh, an interactive tool so that the next time you have a power struggle with one of your children, which you will, um, Use that to reflect then afterwards to say, what could, I, what could I have done differently? Because you, I can't make my kid behave any differently, but I can change the way I responded. All right, we're going to come back to the questions at the end because you've been asking some really great questions. All right, here's where we come into the nitty gritty. Okay, 
and a, as a caveat here, because you heard me say, you will still have power struggles. You will still have power struggles. That is just the way it's going to go. Um, but hopefully they won't be ones that make you feel uncomfortable or make you say things or do things that, you're, you, that you know is not okay. Go ahead. All right, so really we're talking more about like preventative. How do we put things in place before a power struggle could occur? So it's kind of like changing the environment or changing our thoughts so that those power struggles don't either happen or get to a place of no return where we then, like Michelle said later, regret what we say. So as we're talking about them, really what are your expectations? What are your non-negotiables? And what are the mm -hmm. things that we can kind of think a little differently about? Um, do we have, like, is it clear? Do your family members know what those expectations are? And do they remain the same for 16, 17 years? Or do we change them as they get older? Right now in my house, we're, it's bedtime. For whatever reason, we, we always had, in, up through middle school, a bedtime for the kids. They had to go to bed by a certain time. Now that we have two in high school, it's kind of this adjustment. Like, what is the expectation now? You cannot go to bed at one in the morning, but you don't have to have a bedtime, that you ha but it has to be reasonable. And so how do we, bring the kids into that conversation so that there's buy-in. Because maybe they have a reason why it shouldn't be at 10 o'clock. They want to stay up to 11. Maybe they really have so much homework that they need to decompress it sometime and they want that extra time. So what is our adjustment to our expectations? And are we con consistent in enforcing it? Because the minute we're not consistent, what do you think happens? You're not consistent one time. What happens the second time they try it? They push that limit again, right? Our, our students and our children, our children want to know what those limits are. They want to know where the ceiling is. They kind of want to know where those walls are. They may push them, but it's part of feeling yes. safe, yep. creating an environment that they know where they really shouldn't go. And they'll still, every once in a while, test it because developmentally that's what they're supposed to do. They want to know it's there. When they have 100% freedom and they don't know what those expectations are, that's where we see some of those intense behavior problems. It is actually terrifying for an eight-year-old to have nothing, to have no boundaries, that they can do and act and behave and whatever and however they want, whenever they want. And so the expectations are the same thing for actually a teenager, maybe not a student, like a senior in high school, but they still need to know that there is a boundary. And I think what Lori just said, the safety, they feel safe. They feel safe. That, that, they're, they're, that they'll be able to, that, that, that there is a boundary. And actually, I had a situation where my son used it as an out. He went to a party. He did not feel comfortable with what was going on there at all. So he's like, oh, my mom, she's making me come home at 10 o'clock. She's, she's, she's making me come home at 10 o'clock. His curfew was like 11 or 12 or whatever it was. But he used me as the excuse because he knew that my, all of his friends knew that I, you know, I had boundaries, I had expectations, I had rules, and all that kind of stuff. So it, think, it's, think about it as a way to provide a tether for your children, especially as they get older, if they need it. And it's interesting. You may have some of your children's friends who like to come to your house because you have more boundaries or expectations yes. than maybe they do at home. Like you have a regular dinner time or you have some sort of routine that makes them feel safe and they, they're craving that because maybe they don't have that in their home. And all of a sudden they're showing up at your house frequently, right? And it's because you've probably made them feel comfortable and welcome and set certain expectations in your house and they want that. It's comforting for them. Mm -hmm. Now, your kids may push back, but that's okay. <laughs> They're supposed to. That's right. And again, it's really what we were talking about earlier about just um, if they are following through on what we're asking them to do, they really need to be thanked, praised, um, extra hugs, whatever it might be, so that there are positive consequences. So we have consequences that are always often thought of as punishment, but it's not always a punishment. It's just how are we reacting to what they're doing? So what are the consequences for doing what you're supposed to do? So we were talking about that first and next, or first and then. So if you do what we're asking you to do, then you get to earn your 
TV time, or then you get to go out with your friends, bless you. So that's that positive reinforcement that we give them for, for meeting those expectations. And then what happens if they don't? Well, then they don't have access to whatever it is that, that they're, they're working towards. Look at curfew, okay? So you have a curfew of 11 o'clock, that they have to be home by 11 o'clock. And they come home at 11 o'clock. How many, how many times have we said, wow, I really appreciate you respecting the curfew? Probably not a lot of times, right? But if they come in 11.15, what do we do? You, you're, you missed your curfew. How, your curfew is 11 o'clock. That's what the rule is. That's what our house rules are. So it's all they hear is what we call corrective feedback instead of reinforcing them for when they do follow the rules. And of course, a lot of people are like, well, they're the rules. Of course they're supposed to follow the rules. But we all like to be reinforced when we're doing the right thing. So if you can kind of balance that with, I thank you so much for emptying the dishwasher, um, like, like you're supposed to, not like you're supposed to, because that's a bad thing too, but um, for helping yeah, out around the house. For helping around the yeah, house. Yes, yeah. right. That's, like you're supposed to is the zinger. That's the sarcasm. That's not authentic communication. Yeah. And again, it goes back to where are you putting that phone, right? Is, is this a big deal or a little deal? Is it something that we actually need to correct? and provide that what ends up being that negative feedback or can we just let that go and then thank them afterwards for spending time with us as a family what do you really want to focus on and that constant kind of the picking on the smaller things then our then our kids start looking for that they don't they always are waiting for us to give them that what we call corrective feedback and it becomes this almost like anxiety producing feeling like what am I doing wrong now or what am I going to be doing wrong next mm -hmm. and so it's just a very uncomfortable place to be and so balancing it with the wow you did exactly what we talked about and what we agreed upon that was amazing I really appreciate the effort you put into that will take you a lot further than constantly just focusing on the things that we're not doing correctly Lori talked a little bit about trying to win. When there's a power struggle, there really should not be a winner and a loser. Ideally, you really want it to be a win-win, okay? I'm asking you to do something. You're telling me no. That's the first part. And if we go down ugly, or we go down the power struggle, and it becomes ugly, then that's a lose-lose, right? If we come down to, all right, we have this issue. I have a curfew that has to be instilled. And we could, so we can have the curfew be 11 o'clock, or we can have it be at 11.15. That might be something, that a compromise that you might be able to make. We could have it be 10.45, shocking how often you can say 11. Would you like your curfew to be 10.45 or 11 o'clock? Of course, it, but you don't care. Okay, they say 10.45, okay, great. But the likelihood is they're gonna say 11, because actually that's what you wanted right from the beginning, was that 11 o'clock. So when you provide the choice, when you provide the conversation with your, stu with your children, it, it invites their cooperation. It invites more, you're, again, role modeling for how it is that you can problem solve a problem. You still have the parameter, you still have the expectation, but it's not, this is the rule. So when you find yourself in that power struggle and you find yourself like I was the crazy person trying to win, you need to catch yourself and step on out. Just like the time out, give your child uh, the opportunity to, I love the, the, um, the flag on the door. That means please do not talk to me right now. I'm not ready to talk to you. Okay, whatever signal they have to give you, honor it and respect it, and then loop around to address the problem or the, the struggle. The nice thing about the, the bandana is, again, going back to brain science, when we are in that fight or flight or we're really angry, our brain doesn't really hear a lot of words. It's kind of that Charlie Brown. It's like, rah, 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 right? Because we just were so mad. And so our emotions basically hijack our logical thinking. When you have something visual, like mm -hmm. a yellow bandana or a sign on the door, that allows our brain to know immediately that we have to, they're, that they're communicating to us that they need a break. They may say to us, I want to be left alone, but we're not really hearing that. When you see something visual, our brain is able to process it a lot better and faster than through words when we're already kind of in that heightened emotional state. So that, that suggestion was my aha. Yes. Because 
it can really make or break what happens next. Yep. So visuals, using something visual can be a great tool. Again, you're always your child's uh, role model. How you handle stress, how you handle the, pro the, the power struggle, you're role modeling for them their entire lives on how to manage that because they're going to get into power struggles in school with their teachers, potentially. They're going to get into power struggles with their friends, with their employers, with their professors. So you are their role model on how you, are, how you manage the power struggle. So sometimes you just have to step away. Stepping away, you need to calm down. Okay, I did not calm down in that situation I described for you. I was not calm in any capacity, okay? And it, doesn't, it never works out if you're coming from anger or fury or heightened emotion. You have to take a breath. Studies show if you take a breath and you, hold, and you um, pause before speaking for 15 seconds, which by the way is a long time. That's a long time. You'll see the reduction of the stress and the conflict go down by 85%. 15 seconds. You, whatever you have going on in your head, you can make your grocery list. You can be yelling and screaming at your daughter or your son in your head for that 15 seconds. But just not talking for 15 seconds decreases the conflict by 85%. No is a complete sentence. May I go to the mall with Sally? No. no. Why not? The answer is no. You may go to Sally's. So you may go to the mall with Sally, you know, Saturday, right now, no. No is a complete sentence. It's okay sometimes to say no. Uh, so really what we were talking about earlier with the offering choices is a really another great strategy to try to avoid heading into those power struggles in the first place. Our children, as we were talking about earlier, are at that place where they're trying to kind of be independent, but they really still want to be with their mom or their dad or their sibling or grandma, like <laughs> whoever it is, right? So they're, they're kind of going back and forth between I want to be independent, yet I still want the comfort of my family. And so by giving them choices, we're allowing them to be independent, but within a structure that's safe for them. And so in, it could be, instead of saying no, if you don't have to say no, it could be, I want to go to the mall with Sally. Well, how about I take you to the mall tomorrow or you invite Sally over today because I have an electrician coming to the house. So instead of my daughter hearing no right away and knowing that she's going to get defensive, I eliminate the no and kind of get right to the why. <laughs> so. The answer really is no, I can't take you, but here, here are two other options. What's your choice? And that helps them develop some of those skills that we were talking about on how to kind of problem solve. Well, what is the better choice that I want right now? And I actually can make it as the child. And that gives me some, some ownership. And so, it empowers, we go back to that empowering exactly. Work. When they have a choice, would you like to go to the mall today or would you like to go to the mall tomorrow? As long as both options are good for you, right. okay? Would you, like to be, would you like the curfew to be 1045 or would you like it to be 11? Would you like to do your homework at the kitchen table or up in your room? Would you like to, do, if you, the more choices you offer, the more empowered your children become. I find with my, my son, I keep going back to him, just because he, he struggles with a lot of that self-regulation, choice for him is key. He has to have choice in what he does in order for follow through to happen. So for homework, he has to make the choice as to when he's going to finish it. Are you going to do your homework right when you get home from school or do you want an hour break and then you're going to do it at whatever time? And so whatever he chooses, now when I say, well, it's this time, it's time you chose to do your homework now, let's get going. The power struggles have decreased significantly because I'm not telling him when to do it. Mm -hmm. He was the one who picked it. All right, when you find yourself engaged in the power struggle, avoid that nagging, lecturing, arguing. They don't work. It doesn't work, as you all know, probably, right? I, I learned that. The past is the past. Let it go. Just let it go. Bring it, because how, much, how many times have you been in a power struggle and then you bring up all the other things that they've done wrong in their life, right? It's not a productive conversation. Your child is really not listening to your words of wisdom. The, the why, sometimes the why, if we go on too long about the why, 
That's Charlie. Wah, 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 it's all this. They don't care. They just do not care. It takes two to argue. It takes two to have a power struggle. So just stop. I know it sounds like so simple, but that walk away, that wave your own white flag, yellow flag, take your deep breath, go take a ride in the car, walk away. Especially if you start seeing it become escalated. I've been in situations where I'm walking away, so I have a yes. dog, and that's my happy place. Like, if I need a break, I'll, I'm, I will say, I'm going to take Coco for a walk. We can continue this after I, after I get back. And I'll have my kids, like, you know, 15, 16, they're following me, yelling at me. And I'm just like, and I will say, I can't engage right now. And I keep walking, and they follow me. And eventually, they stop, because I'm not giving them what they want, which is that engagement. And by the time I get back from my walk, we've all kind of come back down. And so it ha being in the, in the right mindset to know that I need to take the walk is the challenge. It's that, what are you going to do before you, you get to that point of no return? And that's where the 15 seconds of thinking comes in and can be kind of life altering in those moments. So just know what works for you so that you can just stop. Good question. So you have to go back to your expectations. You have to go back. You establish with your family meeting, with your dialogue, with your with your children. Here are the expectations. And when you do your expectations, we're all in. Here's the things you get: your phone, blah 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 blah. These are all things you get. And when you don't, I have to take those away. Okay, they get taken away. Not I have to. They get taken away because that's the natural consequence. Because we've already agreed upon that. Sometimes I've I've worked with families where we've done like family contracts of exactly everyone's role. Who's going to do what and when and how? So there are no, uh, there are no misunderstandings. And if you have brilliant ones like yours, <laughs> I might have to have a very explicit contract. <laughs> Right there with you. Again, my, my husband wants to fix everything. Yeah, my younger son says something to me, Mom, you know, if I want something, I know, just go to Dad. I know it. He told me it's fine. But if I need something, then I have to come back. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so, so, so those are more the personal family things that you want to sit down with. Everyone, should, ideally, everyone should be sitting at the table, but you sit, who, who sits at the table, sits at the table originally. And then you can start inviting, continue to invite them to sit at the table to put those expectations in. Because they're expecting, you do this, we're all in, you don't, this is what's going to happen. And we're all crystal clear about that. And sometimes it's starting with something simple to get everybody on the same page. Not all of your, you know, whatever expectations are your, for your whole home all day long. Start with one thing. Maybe start with the expectations of that, I don't know, morning routine, like getting up and getting out. What is the expectation? Part of it is after you eat breakfast, everything that you just used has to be put away. Start with one thing so everyone can be, feel successful because sometimes it is the adult also who needs to have that aha moment about the importance of, of everybody being part of the same unit and participating and supporting each other. Mm -hmm. and, and when they, they put, put it in the sink, sink, then what do you say? Thank you for following the rules. Thank, thank you for putting your dishes away, whatever it is. It works with your spouses too. <laughs> it does. It works for me. You know, so I like when someone says to me, thanks for helping out around the house. Or if my husband's cooking and I'm cleaning up and he says to me, you know what? I thank you for doing all the dishes. That just made life so much easier. Makes me feel happy. So it's okay to, to take some of these and use some of these strategies for, for our peers as well. So, so we, sorry. So, so go ahead. Yes. Five minutes left. 
Yeah. Okay, you're two minutes left. Time for the iPad to clock. No! Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, and so I'll go up and I'll say, either you turn it off or I turn it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And eventually I end up having to pry the iPad out of their finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Playing on the iPad. iPad. Right. I told them right. Right. So, like I said, you're still going to have the power struggles, and sometimes it's going to just take longer mm -hmm. to kind of establish those expectations. So, for instance, with the iPad, the, the agreement is 30 minutes on the iPad, so the expectation might be where you have this dialogue before an agreement. So, you give it to me, you still get 30 minutes tomorrow, and if you don't, then each minute it takes for you to give it to me, that I subtract that from the next time you go. You get access Or you're to like borrowing tomorrow's minutes. Exactly. Your bar. The other thing is too is kind of. Then they don't. Then they don't get. And it the sometimes next you just have to take the iPad away. Right. Right. Sometimes, sometimes you just have to take it away. And sometimes it's like thinking strategically too. So if you're at the pool and you need to leave, so maybe you you have them have like a snack at a table first, knowing that right after you're leaving. So sometimes it's also kind of trying to think a couple steps ahead. Same with the electronics. Maybe they're allowed that 30 minutes right before dinner. Whatever it is that's, that's enticing enough to get them off the computer and not just into kind of what we would consider open space. So think kind of like what, your, what does your day look like? What's your first activity? How can you transition into that next one? Is it that my kids, yeah, they really like fruit roll-ups. And if I say, oh, come out of the pool. We are having snack. It's fruit roll-ups. And you know 10 minutes later you're leaving. So then you already have them kind of corralled. And then you say, oh, we gotta, we're gonna, you know, now we're having snack, just to let you know right after snack, we're going to be leaving. You had extra pool time earlier. Whatever it is, same with the, elect the electronics, we probably can have a 17-day training on how to control it, and we probably still won't have an answer. It's really, it's a big problem. And with electronics, we do have a digital workshop. Yay. Yes. There's a digital workshop and resources that the county offers to help problem solve through some of those challenges that we have. <laughs> I'm sure the lifeguards appreciate that. <laughs> no, they whistle, I think. They're breaks, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we do. We, for time's sake, we need to move it on. When you have that constant power struggle, it's important to brainstorm. And as ridiculous as the, as the ideas from your child comes, write it down. I, yesterday I was working, I was brainstorming with a student yesterday, things he could earn. He's like, I really want pizza. I'm like, all right, we're going to put down pizza because all those uh, bullets we're going to talk about and we're going to, we're going to cross off or add to depending on what the conversation is. And what's realistic, I'm not buying you pizza. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Your teacher's not going to buy you pizza. So we'll have to. Okay, so we're not going to do this activity for the sake of time. You have two articles in your um, packet. One is called GEM, Genuine Encounter Moments. Just to, it, it kind of helps guide you on how to have more of those profound, all-in, lean-in, completely conversations with your, with your children and how you can create those opportunities. And the other one is just more tips on how to, for the most part, avoid and or prevent the frequency of your power struggles. I'm not going to say no power struggles. Reduce. 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 All right, you also have in your paper now a 3-2-1 re uh, reflection. This is for your own personal use of three things, something you learned, your aha insight, 
and one question you might have. Erica, how might, if they have specific questions, how might we address that? Because we do have to look at time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And the other thing is you have a sticky note. One second. Would you have a sticky note somewhere on your packet? If you, for our own feedback, as we do, if, as we potentially do this again um, down the road, if you can give us your aha moment, um, and there's a two pieces of chart paper out there, if you could just put it on there, just so that we um, can gather more data, really, as to really what was uh, very meaningful for the group. Someone had a question. Complete sentence. Definitely a whole nother class because a strong willed child is a whole different animal. <laughs> And if you want to stay afterwards, after we're done completing everything, I have a phenomenal article for you. Article? Okay. Actually, so how about if I do this? I will share the article with Erica, and she will put it on this wherever it goes. Okay? Is that okay? Okay. All right. Totally different. Yes. Authentic communication is, I am so disappointed, or I feel so angry when I found out that the credit card was used and, and you were not given permission to use it. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting over that. Okay, so help me process and how, let's figure out how this is not going to happen again, because it's a trust issue now. Now it's a trust issue. And it's really important for us to trust each other because I'm your mom and I'm here to protect you. And we also have to make sure that we're trusting each other. I don't have to keep an eagle eye on you all the time. So how can, again, we go back to that brainstorming, problem solving. No, not explain. Well, so if we're like, if we're like, I, I told you to stop doing that. How can you stop? No, we're not. And you're, we keep engaging back and forth, and then and then and then I give them the whole reason why. You know, like 18 uh, sentences of the reason why. We're talking way too much, and it's all we're doing is inviting more of the power struggle. We're talking. If you find yourself talking too much and explaining too much, shh. Shh. I I've said this is what has to happen. First you do this, then you get to do this, and then you walk away. You physically will have, might have to walk away. It's highly likely you'll have to, for something like that, you'll, you'll highly likely have to walk away. I find it hard because you're in a habit, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's a hard thing to break. So you almost have to work with your partner. Yes. And say, if you find me doing this, mm -hmm. you have to have a signal that says, break. Right? Because the other one talks too much. 
Yeah. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. And you have to have that agreement because sometimes I do that to my husband. He's like, what? Why are you giving me the signal? Because you're talking too much. <laughs> right. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. And because remember, fundamentally, okay, so we do a great job of remembering all the things that our kids have done wrong. But really and truly, how many times have your kids come from someone's house and they're like, oh my God, Lori, she is the most amazing guest. And you're like, who are you talking about? Are you sure? So let's keep it in perspective. Let's keep it in perspective. I appreciate and applaud trying to find always new strategies as a parent. Again, I have all adult children, and I still, you know, communicating. I have a not, you know, like a non-communicative kid, and I have a, a quiet, shy kid, and then I have my daughter who's asking these ridiculous questions or these deep thought questions. <laughs> and I'm like, where is this coming from? So just, fundamentally, though, our kids are great. Okay, and we have to keep we have to keep that in mind, even when they do really. Stupid things. Let me tell you, my son did something really, really, really bad. Really, really bad. But because it's being televised, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> um, and I was angry, and I also wanted to protect him, though, right? You still want to protect him, and you still want to take care of him, and you still want him to be okay. So, and, and to, I mean, today we're fine. You, it's just, it's coming where your mindset comes from and where your perspective is coming from. You still love your children no matter what. It is, I'm assuming it's unconditional, right? You love your children unconditionally. They're going to do things, they're going to mess up. They're going to mess up a lot sometimes. And sometimes they're going to mess up really, really bad where they're going to really need you not to be the crazy lunatic like I was my sister, with my daughter. It, you have to just be there for them to know that you are their parent and that you're still going to love them and you will help them and this better never happen again. So I've lived, I've, I've lived it. I got it. All right. Any, questions, any other questions? Or for the, actually, for the, um, let's close it. And if you want to stay afterwards, you are welcome to stay. Um, thank you so much for attending. We really appreciate it. Thank you.